enough nuclear power to destroy the human race several times over. This is an intercontinental ballistic missile that appears out of nowhere in the middle of the ocean after breaking through 40 meters of water. Just as it exits the water, its solid fuel rocket motor is ignited and the missile begins its supersonic journey into space. Then, once in space, the missile begins to search for stars as reference points to reorient and navigate. After traveling about 12,000 kilometers, a sequence of events will occur very quickly. It is known that upon impact, more than five different cities will be partially destroyed, an event that would claim the lives of more than two million people, with over six million suffering third-degree burns and being exposed to lethal doses of radiation. All this with just one single missile, and all this technology was achieved back in the 1990s, this is the UGM-133 Trident II D-5, the missile that is responsible for world peace. In 1971, the United States Navy began a series of studies on an advanced long-range missile system launched from underwater, known as ULMS, Undersea Long-Range Missile System. The ULMS program included a long-term modernization plan, proposing the development of a missile with much greater range, called ULMS-2, which was supposed to reach twice the range of the current Poseidon missile. The Poseidon was an intercontinental ballistic missile launched from submerged submarines, one of its key features, which allowed the entire launch process to remain secret, difficult to detect, and hard to intercept. Other features of the Poseidon included a range of 4,600 kilometers, a greater payload capacity, higher speed, capable of reaching up to Mach 19, or about 8 km per second, and better accuracy. This technology was highly classified at the time. In May of 1972, the term ULMS-2 was replaced by Trident, a name referencing the weapon associated with Roman and Greek mythology, often depicted in the hands of Poseidon, the god of the sea. The Trident II is the maritime component of the so-called United States Nuclear Triad. This triad includes land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles like the Minuteman III and strategic nuclear bombers such as the B-2 Spirit, the most expensive aircraft in the world. This triad gives the United States the capability to initiate a nuclear strike as well as to retaliate from three different domains, sea, air, and land. The Trident would be such a large missile that a new family of nuclear submarines was developed exclusively to carry them, known as the Ohio class. Each of these submarines, which are the largest in American territory and are powered by nuclear propulsion, currently carries 20 Trident II missiles. Originally developed by Lockheed Martin Space Systems, the Trident II measures 13.5 meters in length, has a diameter of 2.1 meters, weighs 59 tons, and has an estimated range of 12,000 kilometers. Its exact range is a closely guarded secret, known only to a few living individuals. The Trident II is a three-stage rocket, each stage containing a solid fuel rocket motor, ignition holding components, and the thrust vector control system. Both the first and second stages are crucial for maintaining the missile's structural integrity. The Trident uses a fuel called NEPE-75, which stands for Nitrate Ester Plasticized Polyether. The 75 indicates that the fuel contains 75% solids in its composition, including HMX, aluminum, and ammonium perchlorate. This fuel can be stored for over 10 years. Between the stages are what are called interstages, or intermediate stages. The second of these, higher up, contains the section of equipments. This section houses the batteries, command sequences, inverters, firing unit, flight termination system, and more. It also includes the thrust vector control system of the third stage, and critical systems for avionics, flight control, and guidance, including the extremely important Mark VI navigation system, the true brain of the missile. 
Let's open a small chapter here to understand the scope and complexity of this system. The Mark VI guidance system was developed through a United States Navy program called Fleet Ballistic Missile and took 10 years of refinement to achieve the required precision. The Mark VI consists of two parts. The inertial measurement unit, which contains inertial instruments mounted on a stabilized gimbal platform, and the electrical assembly, which contains computers and support electronics. The electrical assembly contains six dedicated computers for gimbal controls, monitoring, and missile orientation and navigation calculations. These systems allow the missile to know, with extreme precision, its velocity, acceleration, position, angular orientation, inertial forces, trajectory, and much more information before and during its flight. All this gives the missile complete independence from external information sources such as radar, GPS, or stellar sightings. The Mark VI was considered one of the most accurate, purely inertial systems in the world at the time of its development in the late 1980s, capable of detecting and measuring movements on the angstrom scale, that is, 100 picometers, equivalent to 0.1 nanometers. But if the Mark VI doesn't rely on external information, why does it need stars to reorient itself, as mentioned at the beginning of the video? The reason takes us back to the late 1960s, when American submarines carrying nuclear weapons began to lose their bearings when submerged. Gyroscopes and other inertial systems recorded all submarine movements and thus could determine their position with accuracy. However, tiny errors accumulated, and when they surfaced, the crew no longer knew exactly where they were. The Navy's solution was to launch GPS satellites. When submarines surfaced, systems would pick up the satellite signal and recalibrate. In the Mark VI, however, instead of using GPS, although that is also possible, stars are used as reference points. Also in the equipment section is the MIRV platform, or Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicle. This is a platform that contains computers, gas stabilizers, avionics, and all the electronics necessary for self-orientation out of Earth's atmosphere. These re-entry vehicles, up to 14 of them on the Trident II, have a conical shape, which makes them more aerodynamically stable and better suited for the brutal atmospheric re-entry phase at over 28,000 km per hour. The black color is actually ablative thermal material, enabling it to withstand the extreme temperatures of re-entry. Inside them is the thermonuclear warhead, the actual atomic bomb. These MIRVs are mounted on a platform called the bus. This bus contains a small motor that, once in space, is activated, allowing the platform to maneuver and eject each MIRV on a separate trajectory or orbit. Above the MIRVs is a fairing that encapsulates everything, protecting it and providing aerodynamic refinement for the missile. At the top is an aerospike, a retractable device used to reduce drag since the missile's nose is not very aerodynamic for supersonic speeds. And this device works so well that it reduces drag by 50%. However, during the missile's design phase, engineers faced a number of problems, including how to make a 59-ton missile with parts that must separate mid-flight, hermetically sealed, since it must be launched from underwater, and what system would propel the missile from the submarine until it is completely out of the water. The solution to the first problem was to pressurize the missile. The Trident II is pressurized with nitrogen, preventing seawater from penetrating any internal part, which could cause damage or increase weight, which would create stability issues. The launch of a Trident missile occurs only on the order of one person, the President of the United States. The Trident, like the other two parts of the Triad, is a last resort, to be used only if all else fails or is ineffective. This order can be issued via a briefcase, popularly known as the nuclear football, a case carried wherever the president goes, whose contents are highly classified. Once the submarine receives this order, a group of officers must authenticate the message by reading and comparing secret codes. 
Once this phase is completed, a series of events happen very quickly. First, the Mark VI navigation and guidance system is initialized and the specific mission trajectory is loaded into the onboard computer's memory. As soon as the launch command is given, the submarine's hatch is opened, revealing a seal that prevents seawater from entering the missile tube. Then, a steam generation system is activated. This system uses a small rocket motor and a compartment separate from the missile, whose exhaust is directed to instantly boil water in a tank. This water boils and turns into steam, traveling along a tube where a valve remains closed. Almost simultaneously, a command is sent to blow the top seal, and the valve opens, releasing steam that enters the bottom of the missile tube. The force of the steam is enough to expel the missile with sufficient speed to travel over 40 meters through water until it is completely out. Once out of the water, sensors and inertial motion detectors confirm that the missile is clear of the ocean and trending downward. Immediately, the first stage motor is ignited. Seconds later, the aero spike is deployed and the missile continues its flight. The thrust vector control is also activated at launch, allowing the motor to gimbal for mid-flight corrections. When the third stage is activated, about two minutes into the flight, the missile is traveling at around 21,600 km per hour, or Mach 18. Once in space, the Astro Inertial Guidance System begins looking for stars to correct small errors in speed and trajectory caused by uncertainties in the submarine's navigation systems during launch. This is done by a special onboard camera that searches for a specific known star in a precise location. If the star is not perfectly in the camera's field of view, it means the inertial system is not precisely calibrated and a correction is made. Then, the third stage is jettisoned and the missile is now on a suborbital trajectory, leaving only the BUS containing the MIRVs. The BUS then performs various maneuvers, positioning itself on different trajectories and orbits, and ejecting a MIRV on each, which will follow its individual target. The method by which the BUS maneuvers and deploys the MIRVs, as well as the extent of horizontal dispersion, remains highly classified. Inside these MIRVs may be a W88-type thermonuclear warhead, weighing 360 kilograms, measuring 1.75 meters in length and 55 centimeters in diameter, with an explosive payload composed of uranium, tritium, and deuterium, capable of releasing a staggering 475 kilotons of destructive power. For comparison, the Little Boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima had just 15 kilotons, and Fat Man, from Nagasaki, had 21 kilotons. If one of these 475 kiloton bombs were dropped on downtown Los Angeles, California, the devastation would be horrific, with over 444,000 deaths and more than 1 million injured. The yellow circle in the center indicates the fireball's diameter, estimated at about 1 kilometer. Everything here is vaporized. The second circle, around 5 kilometers from the explosion's epicenter, indicates moderate blast damage. In this region, buildings and houses collapse and everything ignites. There are simply no survivors. The third circle marks the range of thermal radiation. Around 9 kilometers from the epicenter, everyone in this area will suffer third-degree burns, often requiring amputation and may develop cancer. Finally, the zone of light blast damage. In this area, house windows will shatter and an overpressure of about 1 PSI will occur. However, despite all this destructive power, it is worth understanding the safety mechanisms it has. Since it is a weapon containing atomic bombs, it features several self-destruct and flight termination mechanisms. The first of these can be activated during the most critical and complicated moment, the launch from the submarine up to surfacing. If a failure occurs, for example the missile doesn't rise high enough to safely break the surface, it can self-deactivate. If a failure occurs mid-flight, or if the missile deviates significantly from its trajectory, it can self-destruct. But this will not cause the onboard nuclear warheads to detonate. 
The development program cost $26 billion, and each missile unit costs $30.9 million. But what if I told you there's a missile that costs a fraction of that and can still hit a target with extreme precision from over a thousand kilometers away? Click this video to know why it became one of the most feared weapons in modern warfare.